big news, the eRosita first data release has just been dropped. For those of you who don't remember, eRosita is an X-ray space telescope, a joint venture between Russia and Germany. Check out my previous video on eRosita if you need a recap. But it's always been a big deal about how the two countries would share the science and ultimately they decided to split the sky directly through the centre, with Germany taking the right side and Russia the left. Now there's one big catch though, Russia had no intentions of ever making their side of the sky public. It's like, it's like, it's like, whereas Germany planned to do so after their science teams took first dibs on the science papers. Now this is kind of bad because it means that the Russian scientists would eventually get the entire sky's worth of x-ray data. Now this week the German side of eRosita has published their first papers and the first data release that comes with it has been dropped. This is a massive surprise because when the Russian-Ukraine war started the eRosita telescope had to be shut down and anyone working on eRosita in Germany had to stop. Anyway I'm just happy it's here now, although the telescope itself has still not been turned back on. This first data release consists of 930,000 x-ray sources, that's 700,000 supermassive black holes, 180,000 x-ray emitting stars, and what I'm most excited for, 12,000 clusters of galaxies. Now to put that into perspective, this is a massive number of x-ray sources for astronomy. In the six months worth of collecting data here, eRosita has detected more sources than the XMM Newton and Chandra X ray telescopes combined in their entire 25 years of operation. So let's take a look at what we have. Like I said, the data were shared equally between German and Russian scientists. So we just get to see the Western Galactic Hemisphere, where on the left side you can see the center of our galaxy and the galactic disk emerging out from that. In X-ray telescopes you're imaging photons but collecting not just the location but also the energy of that photon. This is very unlike images made with optical telescopes where bright pixels are locations where many photons have hit. In x-rays we don't get many photons, we get like one or two per second for a faint source whereas you might get millions of photons per second for a faint optical source. So to make this pretty image they split the photons into three categories based on the energies of their photons, low, medium and high, and then they assign the low energies to the red channel, the medium energies to the green channel, and the high energies to the blue channel. This allows them to make an RGB image. They also did a wavelet filtering analysis to pick out all of the point sources, so that's the active galactic nuclei, AGN, or supermassive black holes. Okay, so back to the main image. First thing that popped out to me was the eRosita bubbles, one in the north and another one in the south. The discovery of these were reported just after the completion of the um, collection of the first part of the data, ERAS1. This was back in 2020 and I made another video back then so I won't talk about it anymore here. We can see this massive bright white blob, that's Scorpius X1, the brightest x-ray source beyond our sun and it was actually the first extrasolar x-ray source ever to be discovered. Scorpius X1 is a neutron star but it's accreting or feeding on a companion star in a binary with it and that's why they believe it's so bright. But actually being bright means that it's actually really difficult to image. This is because it emits too many x-ray photons. When two or more x-ray photons arrive at a detector pixel within a single readout, the detector will record them as a single photon and this is known as parlop. The event will have an energy that is the sum of the energies of the individual photons and this will lead to a distortion in the recorded energy spectrum. 
And since some photons are not counted as individual events, you might underestimate that source's brightness. After a supernova explosion, the ejected material from the star collides with the surrounding interstellar medium, creating shock waves that heat the gas to millions of degrees. This extremely hot gas emits brightly in the X-rays. So supernova remnants are also bright in X-ray. Here we see Vela supernova remnant and Hoinga. As I said previously, bright X-ray regions are where the largest uncertainties are. Here you're more likely to see spurious or fake X-ray sources. An effect similar to pileup is known as optical loading, where low energy photons like optical and UV photons accumulate on the pixels and then pass the detection threshold of being like identified as an X-ray photon. Also, we have the south ecliptic pole region, which doesn't seem bright, but also poses issues because the exposure here is much deeper than the typical depth across the rest of the sky. The scanning strategy of Erosita images means that the regions near the ecliptic equator are imaged about six times within the time span of one day. And this is done every day for six months. The time span and the number of visits increases with the ecliptic latitude. So it's most frequently seeing the ecliptic poles. Here the exposure time is more than 100 times that of the rest of the survey. And this is great because you'll be able to see much, much fainter sources, but the detection algorithm currently as it stands is not optimized for deep exposures. One of the big problems here is deblending sources that are close together. They resemble one single source. Thankfully, a new data processing and source detection algorithm that's optimized for this deep area is coming soon. The EFED survey is notably another one of these deep regions. EFED stands for the Erosita Final Equatorial Depth Survey, and it's designed to provide a uniform exposure over a big field, 140 square degrees. And it's about 50% deeper from what you expect from the rest of the survey at the end of the four year period. Now, this is the closest cluster to us. It's the Virgo cluster of galaxies, and of course it's worth a shout out because the main motivation of Erosita, starting way back in the early 2000s, was to use galaxy clusters for cosmology. They deemed that about 100,000 galaxy clusters are needed to get sensitive cosmological measurements. And then what's not marked out on this image is this newly discovered filament between two galaxy clusters. These clusters are Abel clusters, and that means they're already really well known for a long time. It's crazy we're only just seeing the connecting gas between them right now, even though we believe clusters are all connected via filaments, reminiscent of the structure of the cosmic web and dark matter distribution in our universe. Filaments act like a skeleton of the cosmic web. They channel matter towards the intersections of the web. That's where the gravitational potential is highest, and that's where galaxy clusters form. So these filaments are essentially the straws that are feeding the growth of galaxy clusters. But detecting filaments in X-rays is challenging due to their diffuse nature and the low density of hot gas that they contain. Anyway, what we've seen from Erosita has been amazing. Let me know if you want me to talk more about Erosita and its results. There's so much that we've learned already from just the six months of data, and there's much more to come in just I think two weeks they're planning to publish their cosmology results which will be pretty exciting. Thank you to my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video and as usual if you enjoyed it please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe.